All right, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We have a beautiful topic today that we are going to spend the next 30 or so minutes talking about. It's a topic that I really enjoy uh, studying and one that I really enjoy learning about. But sometimes it can be a little bit daunting, I think, uh, in some circles, the way we talk about it and the way we discuss it. We're talking about sacrifice. Okay, sacrifice. Um, before we start, maybe let's see if let's test out my teacher-student theory. Would anyone here like to give me their one-sentence def one definition of what, it, what does sacrifice mean? If you're explaining, yes. Very good. Giving up something for something else. That's very good. Mashallah, that's a good uh, definition. I'm going to add to your definition just a little bit. The uh, formal definition of sacrifice is to give up something you value, so give up something valuable for something else that you deem to be more important and more valuable, okay? So you're giving up something valuable for something else more valuable and more important. That is the definition of a sacrifice. There are many amongst the companions of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam who personified this trait. And of course, the Prophet Sallallahu himself also personified this trait. Today, inshallah ta'ala, we are going to be looking at the example of Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha, who has the distinct honor of being the first martyr of the nation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay? We're going to start off with just some facts. I'm going to give you some facts, okay? The reason I'm going to do this instead of just telling her story is I want you to have a context. It's important when we study the Sahaba to paint a picture of what they were living in. Who was this person? What was their society? What was their context? So that we can really appreciate what this person went through. Okay? Y'all ready? So I'm going to tell you three things about Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha that I want you to remember. Number one, her age. Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha was about 20 years older than the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa How many years older? 20 years. She was also a black Abyssinian woman. So originally from Ethiopia, modern day Ethiopia. She was a black Abyssinian woman. So one, 20 years older than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Two, she was a black Abyssinian woman. The third thing that you need to know about her is that she was a slave. She was a slave. She was owned by a man named uh, Abu Hudayfa ibn al-Mughira. Okay? So what are the three things we're remembering about her? Number one, age, 20 years older than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Number two, she's a black Abyssinian woman, so she's not from Mecca, right? Number three, she's a slave to a man named Abu Hudayfa ibn al-Mughira. Uh, Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha was married to a man named Yasir Yasir radiallahu ta'ala anhu also a sahaba or a sahabi uh, Yasir was actually an immigrant to Mecca from Yemen so he wasn't originally from Mecca either he was from Yemen and when he came to Mecca he sought the protection of Abu Hudayfa who owned Sumayya and so it is Abu Hudayfa who said yes you can be under my protection and here you can marry my slave woman. And that's how the two of them were married, and they had a son named Ammar bin Yasir. Ammar was about the same age as the Prophet them. Okay? So everybody with me so far? We've painted a picture of the family. Now the next thing we have to do is we have to talk politics. Now y'all know how we Texans feel about Californians, so I'll just talk about muck and politics today and we'll, we'll leave off American politics, okay? So let's understand what was the politics of Mecca when the Prophet Sallallahu uh, began his message, okay? Now, the Prophet Sallallahu is in a tribe called Quraysh. Quraysh is made up of many little clans, like little families that are within the tribe of Quraysh. All right. The clan that Sumayya is owned by is called Banu Makhzum. Okay, so Sumayya is from a clan called Banu Makhzum. What's the name of the Prophet's clan? Banu Hashim. Okay, so you have Banu Makhzum, Banu Hashim. 
y'all have to realize that Banu Makhzum and Banu Hashim are rivals. They've had this rivalry going on for decades, right? So Banu Makhzum looks at Banu Hashim and they're like, oh, y'all think you're wealthier than us? We're going to show you our wealth is more. Oh, okay, so y'all think you're better at poetry? We're going to go ahead and we're going to show you when the next poetry slam comes up what we can do. Oh, you guys think you're more hospitable? Well, we're going to come out when the pilgrims come out. We're going to roll out the welcome mat like nobody's seen, right? Banu Makhzum always wants to compete with Banu Hashim. And they're neck and neck, right? Banu Makhzum doesn't feel right now that Banu Hashim is uh, better than them until the Prophet Sallam comes along and Banu Hashim has a prophet. From the eyes of Banu Makhzum, they don't look at it like Allah has blessed us, he sent us a prophet, you know, we're so blessed to be in the presence of the prophet. No, they look at it and they think, oh no, if we accept this man, then we have to accept Banu Hashim as an authority over us, and they can't have that. So they get very upset, and they start a campaign against the Prophet wasallam and against the prophethood of the Prophet wasallam. Does anyone want to guess who else is in Banu Makhzum? who doesn't like the Prophet Sallallahu Just a wild guess. Abu Jahal. Abu Jahal is one of these members of Banu Makhzum, the clan that Sumeya is in, and he hates Banu Hashim, and he hates the Prophet Sallallahu Imagine how he must feel then when a poor slave woman and her family go against this rivalry and they choose to recognize the truth and accept the Prophet ﷺ as their leader. Abu Jahl can't take it. He is angry. And he says, I'm going to make an example of these people. And all of the people who didn't have any means of protection, they didn't have any family, they were considered the lowest of the low in the society, if we look at Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha, she is at a complete disadvantage if you look at socioeconomic status, if you look at family ties, right? She's literally in the worst position possible if you look at it from that perspective. And yet, she is intelligent enough to be able to recognize the truth and accept it. While someone like... While someone like Abu Jahl, with all of his status and all of his wealth and all of his position, was not able to accept the truth. So Abu Jahl gets really enraged and he starts to torture these people publicly. And his goal is to scare other people that if you go against Banu Makhzum, this is what's going to happen to you. And as he is torturing, these people, Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha and her family, publicly, they're not wavering in their resolve. Now, I want us to pause here. I want to ask you all something. How old was the Prophet Sallallahu when he became a prophet and received revelation? 40. So how old was Sumayya? 60. 60. She's 60 years old. And this kind of makes me tear up a little bit because my mom is in her 60s. And I, I just can't imagine anyone even insulting her, let alone beating her or harming her, right? So Mayr radiallahu ta'ala anha was in her 60s. And Abu Jahl would come and he would put chain mail on them and leave them out in the sun. He would beat them. He would insult them. He would scream at them. He would tell them to renounce their faith and insult the Prophet Sallallahu but Sumayya and her family, they stood strong and Sumayya would respond to him and say, no, enemy of Allah, I will never do that. And she would insult him. It's narrated that when she accepted Islam, she went to the Prophet Sallallahu and she said to him, she said, Ashhadu annaka la Rasulullah. I bear witness that indeed you are the messenger of Allah. Wa anna wa'daka al -haq. And your promise is true. You see the amount of faith she had. She had no doubt in the Prophet ﷺ or in his message. And that faith gave her strength. And we know that the stronger she got, the angrier Abu Jahl got. Until it got to the day when he told her 
that she must curse the Prophet ﷺ in public, and she refused and spat in his face. And at this point, he took his spear and ran it through her midsection and killed her. And so Sumayya became the first martyr, an old black woman who was a slave, who had never seen any good in this life, at the very end of her life, Allah shows her her position in Jannah, because we know that the martyr is shown their position in Jannah, right? So at the end of her life, this is where Allah gives her glad tidings and congratulates her and shows her the beautiful future that she is now embarking on. Her husband Yasser was even older than her, and he died actually soon after she passed away. He was very frail as well, and his body couldn't take it. And we know that their son Ammar eventually said the words that Abu Jahl had commanded him to say. And the Prophet ﷺ, what did he say to Ammar when Ammar was feeling so sad and so devastated and traumatized? The Prophet ﷺ told him, if they tell you to do that again, go ahead and say the words. Because I know it's not in your heart. Right? Now, I want us to just come back for a minute. We were in Mecca thousands of years ago, let's come back to California in 2022 and let's ask ourselves about sacrifice now that we have heard the legacy that came before us. We said that it is giving up something you value for something you deem to be more important. So Maya gave up her life. Before that, she gave up her Comfort, her safety, her dignity was taken from her. She gave up a lot. And these are valuable things. That's the first thing I want us to recognize about sacrifice. It does require us to give up something we care about. It's important to realize this because sometimes in our own lives when we are called to sacrifice for the sake of Allah, we have a hard time recognizing that we're losing something as well. And sometimes that loss comes with a feeling of grief, right? Think about, for example, somebody who has an amazing job, they love their coworkers, the pay is wonderful, and then they start to do some research and they say, you know what, this business that I'm working at is not a halal business, right? It's not, it's not a great place to be working. Uh, the business itself doesn't align with my faith. They quit their job. They did something, they left something for the sake of something more important, but there is still a loss and it's okay to acknowledge that, right? I say this because the Prophet ﷺ cared very much about Ammar and the loss that he had gone through when he lost his mother and then his father. I want you to think what the state of Ammar عنه, must have been because realize that after his mother died, Abu Jahl continued walking the streets of Mecca, a free man, for many years, right? Abu Jahl died in the Battle of Badr, but his mother was one of the very first believers and died in the very early days of Islam. So it's probably another five, six, seven years before the Battle of Badr. What must it be like to watch the man who brutally tortured and murdered one's mother just walking around in his tribe no arrest, no trial, no justice, no care from the society. It was a great loss. But people didn't look at Ammar and say, well, your parents are in Jannah. Why are you sad? No, people didn't tell him that. They comforted him. And when Abu Jahl was actually killed in the Battle of Badr, the Prophet ﷺ made a point to find Ammar and tell him that Allah has killed the one who murdered your mother. Know that that justice that you needed, that trial that you longed for, Allah has taken care of it for you, right? Because he lost something valuable. It's okay to acknowledge that we have lost something that was valuable to us. The second part of our definition is you're giving up something you value for, something that is, more valuable and more important. What was more valuable and more important to Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha? What was it that she longed for? I need y'all to be louder. 
Her faith, what else? Jannah, what else? Allah Azza wa Jal, right? The pleasure of Allah to stand up for the truth, to stand up for justice, to show others that she would not be moved, right? Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha believed in the promise of Allah and she stood by it until the end. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with her. And I, this is what I wanted us to end with because you see, making a sacrifice is not easy, right? We will all go through something in our lives where we have to make a decision about something that might not be the best for our faith. It could be a job, it could be the company that you keep, it could be where you work, where you live, whatever it is, right? And in that moment, somebody might say, but I'm so afraid of losing this. I'm so afraid of losing this job and this amazing income. I'm so afraid of losing these friends who I have, right? I'm afraid of losing this. There's an answer that one might share with them that Allah SWT gives us. You see, here's the thing. Everybody in their life will experience some kind of loss, right? Life has ups and downs. Nobody's life is perfect. Nobody is 100% happy in this life, right? Allah SWT promises us, and he makes this declaration in Surah Al-Baqarah, where he says, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ Allah says that without a doubt, we will test you through some sort of fear that you might face, hunger, a reduction in uh, wealth, and even in lives, and in fruits. And this is everybody in the world, Muslims and non-Muslims. We're all going to go through trials. What's the difference then between a person of faith like Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha and a person who's lacking faith. The difference is the benefit that they get from that trial. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, sabirin." At the end of this ayah or at the end of this statement, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبَشِّرِ sabirin." Congratulate those who are steadfast and have resolve. الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا Those who, when some sort of difficulty comes to them, they say, and what is it that the Qur'an tells us to say at this point? إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ This is not something you say only when someone passes away, but it's something that we actually say during any sort of difficulty. Why? Because it helps to ground us and it gives us a perspective. Inna lillahi. Indeed, we belong to Allah. Why is this important? Because it reminds me that I might be feeling a loss, but Allah owns me, right? I belong to Allah. And so I don't really own anything in this life, right? How can I say I own something and therefore I lost something when everything, even I belong to Allah? So that's the first per thing, the first perspective that we have to have. The second perspective is, وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَجِعُونَ We're returning back to Allah. It reminds me to focus on the bigger picture, right? I might not be worried so much about losing a six-figure job when I'm thinking about the Akhirah. No six-figure job can buy you the Akhirah. The paradise that the Prophet ﷺ promised Sumayya and her family no money can buy that. No status can buy that. No president or king or queen can ask Allah to give you that. Right? Once you realize that, then you start to prioritize a little bit more. That thing that we were worried about might become a little less important. And pleasing Allah, keeping our faith, and moving forward and growing to to become better servants of Allah becomes more important to us, right? So we say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Allah SWT says, those people, ula'ika alayhim salawatun min rabbihim wa rahmah. Those people will have Allah's blessings and his mercy. Wa ula'ika humul muhtadun. Those are the ones who are truly guided, right? Allah SWT is giving us a perspective. There's another ayah that's very similar to this that I really like. 
Um, this ayah is in regards to the Muslims um, when they are in times of war. So this ayah is particularly talking about in times of war, but it can be generalized as well where the Prophet ﷺ, or, sorry, Allah Azza wa Jal tells uh, the believers, وَلَا تَهِنُوا فِي ابْتِغَاءِ الْقَوْمِ Don't get tired and don't stop uh, pursuing the enemy. إِن تَكُونُوا تَأْلَمُونَ فَإِنَّهُمْ يَأْلَمُونَ كَمَا تَأْلَمُونَ if you're experiencing some sort of loss or you're suffering, then realize that they are also experiencing loss and suffering. Right? I mean, this is a battlefield. Everybody's going to experience loss. There's going to be difficulty. But what's the difference between you two? وَتَرْجُونَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَرْجُونَ You Muslims, you have hope in something from Allah that they could never hope for. You have hope in something from Allah that they could never hope for. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-knowing and wise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what we're going through. Right? He is al-ra'uf. He knows what we're going through. And he cares about us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees the pain. Sometimes people don't understand our sacrifices. Sometimes people belittle our sacrifices. Because remember we said you're sacrificing something you value. Other people may not value that thing that you sacrificed. Right? People are different. Um, I'll give you, y'all want to hear an example? I'll give you an example. So I grew up in Saudi Arabia. I was there for 17 years. Um, then I moved to Iowa for college. Do you know one thing that's in Saudi Arabia that we don't really have in Iowa? You want to guess? Halal, yes, thank you. Here somebody gets it. Halal meat. Halal meat. So we moved to Iowa and we're basically on this vegetarian diet. I moved with my twin sister. So we're on this vegetarian diet. And my, here's my twin sister. Oh my God, it's so hard being vegetarian, so hard to find food. And I couldn't understand her suffering. Do you know why? I've been vegetarian since I was five. I don't like the taste of meat. It does not taste like food to me. So I didn't really care. Uh, Ustada Maryam uh, mentioned the ayah in Surah Waqi'ah, right? وَلَحْمِ طَيْرٍ مِمَّا يَشْتَهُونَ My sister loves Surah Al-Waqi'ah. She always quotes this ayah to me. She's like, you need to get to Jannah so you can eat meat and like it. <laughs> right? So her sacrifice, I, I couldn't value it. I mean, I understood she was a little miserable, right? All y'all who eat meat can probably sympathize with her more than I did. But I didn't value it. Yeah, I had my corn. I was corn country, and they have great corn, and I really like corn. Uh, right? So I couldn't value her sacrifice. I didn't understand what the big deal is. There's plenty of food, right? <laughs> yeah, some people here are like, you're a terrible sister, right? But that's how I felt. And, and may Allah Sata reward her for her, her sacrifice and forgive me for being unsympathetic. Um, but people won't always understand what you're going through. But Allah sees it, right? So whenever we are called to stand for what is right, to give up something we value for something even more important, we have to remember that Allah sees us. And Allah understands us better than we understand ourselves and even if the rest of the world doesn't know what you went through to get to where you are or they don't appreciate what you went through and they don't acknowledge it Allah sees it Allah appreciates it and Allah acknowledges it so I pray that Allah Santa allows us to be people of true faith who are able to overcome the difficulties that we have in this life because we have hope in Allah in the next life. I pray that Allah Santa allows us to look at the example of Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha, our beautiful forerunner in the deen, and allows us to really appreciate what she and her family went through in order for us to be able to inherit this beautiful deen and to be able to practice it. I pray that Allah Santa allows us to be people of true sabr, and Allah SWT allows us to be people who when we are going through difficulty, we say with sincerity, inna lillahi wa inna ilihi raji'un. And we pray to him and we ask him for his guidance. May Allah SWT uh, accept all that is said and heard here.
here today. Anything that I have said that may have been incorrect, I pray that you all forgive me. I pray Allah SWT forgives me. And I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal will allow us all to uh, reunite with those we love in Jannah. I pray that Allah SWT allows us all to meet the Prophet SAW and his companions and Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha um, and to, to, you know, finally thank them for everything they went through for us. May Allah SWT make it easy for all of us. Barakallahu feekum.